to the sustainability imperative, where we'll discuss the future of sustainability and climate change. I'm Crystal Ball. As the country begins to transition away from coal to natural gas and renewables, questions are arising about what that shift will actually look like, and especially how to make sure that vulnerable communities are not left behind. Today, we're going to explore what the future of sustainability holds in policy and in practice. Joining us now is Wesley Look. He's a senior research associate at Resources for the Future. That's an independent nonprofit research institution. Great to have you, Wesley. Thanks so much. Good to be here. So first off, you all recently released a report that analyzed over 100 different policies that could help support fossil fuel workers and their communities as we shift to a low carbon economy. Can you just take us through some of the top lines there? You bet. Yeah. So um, there are really five key insights from the report. Um, these insights are designed to help policymakers think through um, the development of these types of solutions, what many refer to as just transition solutions. So the, the first <clears throat> key insight, um, we really try to boil these down. The first key insight is that multiple um, and customizable policy types are needed. So we look at policies uh, um, <clears throat> across a number of different domains economic development, workforce development, environmental remediation and infrastructure, and then sort of public benefits policies <clears throat> that support um, income and, and um, health care needs of, of workers and communities. Um, so that's that first, the first key point is that there's really no silver bullet to this transition issue. We need to take a, um, a, a multi um, disciplinary approach. The other piece is that we identify that those policies should be customizable. And what we mean there is that we find in our research that um, these sorts of interventions are more effective when they're tailored to local circumstances. You know, each community is different. And in many cases, also when they're tailored to specific populations. So we might think of um, coal workers um, and particularly perhaps um, low income coworkers. So the other, um, the other piece, uh, the, the second item that we identify, a key finding um, we identify is that coordinated delivery is essential, both across federal agencies and between the federal government and state and local governments. The third insight that we share in our report is that the um, timing and sequencing of policy implementation is important. So you've got some really essential front end policy interventions like planning um, and what's referred to as pre-development, which helps to identify projects that are ready for investment. Um, <clears throat> and then you have some more kind of medium and long term interventions. Workforce training is potentially more of a, um, a midterm intervention because there needs to be time for new skills to be developed um, uh, to transition perhaps into a new profession. Um, and then some more long-term investments are things like infrastructure and environmental remediation. Now, some things, infrastructure is a perfect example. I know we'll be talking about the, the Biden administration proposal on infrastructure. Um, infrastructure, I think, is kind of a win-win in the context of um, transition policy because it can put people to work right away, building the conditions for long-term economic prosperity and diversification in regions that have been pretty um, centrally developed around you know, fossil energy economies. So um, there's a real strength there for infrastructure. I'll quickly run through the last two key findings in our report. Sure. Um, <clears throat> the next is that sort of as the term just transition belies, equitable and inclusive policymaking um, is essential. So this begins with proper kind of consultation and involvement um, with uh, um, energy communities in the development of policies um, to help them. Um, <clears throat> also looking at ways in which policies can address uh, a legacy of underinvestment in, in those communities. Um, <clears throat> we also talk about the importance to, of, of making programs accessible and transparent as a, as a component of equity. Lastly, we point to um, the fact that um, local and state governments may experience uh, significant shortfalls in their in their public revenues and therefore in their budgets. And so there need to be policies that think about how to shore up those um, those municipal and state finances. Mm, that's actually a really important part that I think doesn't get enough attention because I've seen the way, for example, as coal mining has declined in Appalachia, that's left a lot of um, county and municipal governments in a really tough position. 
Let's make this all a little bit more concrete. So using the sort of classic example of the coal miner in West Virginia, these are actually fairly high paying jobs, right? So these are somebody could be making, you know, solid middle class income. Work is extraordinarily difficult. It's extraordinarily uncertain, but you're able to provide for your family ultimately. What might, might a transition look like for that coal miner who's making a good salary right now into another career path that provides equally for uh, them and their families? It's a great point, you know, that there is, we're not just talking about jobs here, but we're talking about um, the quality of jobs, certain, certain um, conditions of work, and that the aim for just transition policy should be to develop family supporting uh, jobs. And so that's jobs that have some degree of parity with the salaries and benefits of um, the jobs that these workers may be coming out of. And you're right that these are good jobs. They're often well-paid jobs. Um, they are often union jobs. Um, one of the things that I think the clean energy industry really needs to reckon with is the fact that there's not much unionization within um, that clean energy sector. And um, <clears throat> this affects job quality, as most research indicates. Um, <clears throat> so, and actually, I would say that the, the Biden proposal, um, while it's still very broad um, and there are a lot of details to be filled in, I think does a lot to identify the need to um, if workers choose to, to, to organize um, and to be part of unions, um, including in the clean energy sector. So <clears throat> I think that that's, that's part of it is, is um, thinking about how, um, how labor can organize within clean energy, but also recognizing that um, <clears throat> the jobs of the future in, let's say, coal communities where there is a decline of coal production won't necessarily be in clean energy, right? And so, <clears throat> Um, I think one of the big questions that we look at in our research and, and think about and, and are interested in doing more work on is, is skill linkage. Um, workers are able to, to earn more, right, when they're able to bring their skills with them. Uh, and that's another strength, I would say, between uh, or, or uh, with um, infrastructure as an approach to transition, because there's, there is some degree, at least, of skill transfer from, let's say, operating heavy machinery um, in the coal mining process and operating heavy machinery to build uh, a new bridge or retrofit a bridge or uh, potentially working on, um, you know, broadband infrastructure development. Um, so yeah, so I think it's sort it's, of, it's sort of essential, getting away yeah. from that trope of like, oh, we're going to teach you to code, right? Just throw on everything that you know and all the skills that you already have and let's do something that's totally different and totally foreign. And all, by the way, there also are no jobs for you in your community that involve this particular skill. Um, let's talk a little bit more about the Biden administration proposal. They unveiled this $2 trillion roughly package, focuses on rebuilding our infrastructure, has some focus on combating climate change as well. There's been some pushback um, from climate activists. Sunrise Movement thought that the numbers that they were seeing there were insufficient. They were less than uh, actually what Joe Biden campaigned on. The numbers, researchers, analysts said he campaigned on something more like a $7 trillion plan over a decade. AOC and progressives in Congress are pushing something more like $10 trillion over a decade. Um, what was your view overall of the package? What pieces do you think are important and what do you wish would have been taken into consideration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the um, kind of core pieces of the proposal from a climate perspective and, you know, speaking specifically, just reducing emissions, so not necessarily in a just transition context, um, <clears throat> is what the proposal includes for electricity. So when we think about decarbonization of the U.S. economy in the next, you know, the next five years and maybe in the next 10 years, the lion's share of those emissions reductions are likely to come from the electricity sector, where there still is a fair amount of coal-fired generation um, and those are really the low-hanging fruit for emissions reductions. I, I work on a, a, a number of research teams at Resources for the Future, and one of them is doing modeling on um, a suite of various policies to cut emissions. And we see that um, the lion's share is coming from the electricity sector. Uh, most of the sectors and the policies that we're analyzing, which includes some of the policies in the Biden proposal, such as a clean energy standard and um, extending the renewable energy or clean energy tax credits, um, <clears throat> show that you know, about 70 to 80 percent um, uh, or the electricity sector reduces emissions by about 70 to 80 percent by 2035. And many of the other sectors barely budge at all. 
Um, so I think that there are a lot of details that need to be filled in. For example, the energy efficiency and clean energy standard is mentioned in the Biden proposal, but there are a lot of details about how you design those, especially in the context of budget reconciliation um, in sort of its, its um, most straightforward um, formulation. The CES is not um, budget reconciliation friendly. And so it's, it's kind of being uh, like transform to fit within that those confines and it's unclear whether or not it will be quite as robust in the end although i think i think there's a good chance it could be so that needs to be detailed further um i think that that it's a historic investment in um, electric vehicles and transportation um, related policies uh my sense is that indeed uh, much more will be needed to robustly decarbonize the transportation sector, which is, you know, about a third of U.S. emissions, according to the U.S. EPA's emissions inventory. Um, and the other space is industrial emissions, also a little less than a third of um, U.S. emissions. And there are a couple um, provisions in the proposal, but again, I think more will be needed to decarbonize the industrial sector. So I think, in short, it gets us on the path it's, it's, a, it's a solid down payment and more is needed. Wes, so great to have your insights and your expertise today. Thank you so much. Happy to be with you. Thank you. And thank you for watching The Sustainability Imperative. We'll have more for you next time.